Okay. We welcome everyone to this October 3rd meeting of the Corsicana ISD Board of Trustees. This is a regular meeting and all items that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby on the audience for guests form and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policies and to provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and maintain a safe and secure environment, mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. These are our core values. We appre appreciate your interest in CISD. So we're gonna start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm gonna introduce some students from Sam Houston, so thank you to you and your parents for coming up here and uh, and your staff. So we've got Aileen Juarez, McCoy Bulware, Tate Smith, Major Yannick, Yendel Contreras, and Tiara Thomas. So we're gonna follow you in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. All right, now we're going to have the invocation. If you could remain standing, Miss Kathy Branch. All right, dear God, thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. I pray um, that you just give us guidance with everything that we say and do, um, and I pray that everything that we do is beneficial to our staff, students, and admin. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Ms. Harrison, is there any audience for guests today? All right, thank you. All right, we're going to move into the superintendent's report. Well, we had a pretty exciting weekend. Um, first of all, we had our Celebrando Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Festival, which was our first ever huge success. The family-friendly event brought the community get together to honor our community's diverse Hispanic and Latinx culture. And this Saturday night, we had our um, Disco Days opportunity as the Corsicana Education Foundation had its annual fundraiser. Um, it supports a variety of programs, including teacher grants, new teacher mini grants, campus celebrations, our CISD end of staff end of year awards, and our senior field day. If you were watching WFAA, um, you hopefully saw a highlight on one of our custodians, Charlize Dawson at Collins Intermediate. Um, she's a wonderful example of what it means to go above and beyond, and she, she loves our students, and they did a great story about how she loves and connects with our students and helps them to be successful um, academically, socially, emotionally. Um, she's just a great asset to our district. 
So this coming week is going to be also very busy. Um, it's homecoming week, and so our students will dress in themed attire, our high school students will in themed attire for homecoming week. And we encourage everyone to attend the bonfire on Thursday night. And of course, homecoming is um, Friday, October 7th. We want to remind our families that tomorrow the high school is hosting FAFSA night. If you don't know what FAFSA is, it's the form that you're required to fill out before your students go to college. It, it applies to everything, including all kinds of scholarships. So we hope our families and our students will go to FAFSA night. A couple of campuses had a clothing drive last week. We unfortunately had a family that lost their home in a fire. So um, we have, we're have we just very appreciative to all the people who supported our students and um, the family by um, contributing to the, do the donated items. Um, this week, Encore Energy is going to be at some of our, several of our campuses to discuss, sa discuss safety awareness. I got to visit with them a little bit at Celebrando, and they are very excited about the information that they're sharing with our students. We are very proud of our campus's safety and security audit. The Texas School Safety Commission audited our campuses um, this past couple of weeks and we had no findings on the CISD campuses. So we're very proud of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great news on that last one, especially. All right, so we're gonna go into, into action items. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is reports from the TASB conference. So as you all know, we, we went to San Antonio two weeks ago and went to the Texas Association of School Boards and we're going to discuss you know what each of us learned a little bit and some of the key takeaways. So, And then at the very end I'll ask Miss Kelly because she's the delegate um, for the TASB conference so we'll get, let's get a little update on what's hopefully coming out of legislation later this, well later in 2023. So who would like to go and talk about what they... I'll go first. All right. um, required training is always um, important and fun, but this time I thought was a really valuable time of learning. Um, there were a lot of legislative updates simply because um, they will go back into session in January. So we heard a lot of of um, things that, that they're going to try to accomplish that um, we know that education is an ever-changing world um, so we have to adapt quickly and um, there's never enough money for what um, we're um, we are held to do so um, probably one of the better um, classes that I took um, was on changing the narrative of your school and how social media has given us the platform to become so negative and to um, start a firestorm with um, a tiny rumor or a mis misinformation. And so um, it was the, you know, the turn of the focus and, and take that away from that negative, you know, of two children fighting well there were 1900 that didn't do everything but they you know everything they were supposed to that day so why did we focus on you know one thing that we're changing so i thought that was one of the valuable um uh, classes that i took um that um, was sponsored by texas um, friends for public education as well as um, terrell isd and beaumont isd so that was one of the better of the required courses that i that i went to I'll go. Um, I think for, we attended a lot of different sessions. Um, I think one topic that really um, stood out because of the needs that all the districts have across the state was on bonds and uh, different, you know, issues and uh, that different districts across the state have come up against when they're trying to pass the bond to be able to accommodate the, their district's growth, um, to improve the technology or um, improve, you know, bathrooms or whatever they're trying to do. And so we were able to attend one of those. Um, it was a district by Palestine, I believe Westwood. Um, and they faced some of the same challenges that we face, um, but they were able to reconnect um, with their community and identify um, some areas that their community wanted to focus on 
uh, with the bond and they were able to get that passed after two failed bonds. So it was a very informative. Um, I think they are a, a school board that we definitely need to connect with, connect with their superintendent to kind of pick their brain um, and see, figure out their approach um, and some things and, and maybe um, different consultants and architects that they used um, because it, it seeing their um, what they've been able to do and get past I think would definitely benefit us um, moving forward because obviously we're going to need um, improvements to our facilities as our community continues to grow and so we have to figure out a way to make that happen because obviously the state does not give us the funding for that so um, they give us the avenue for a bond so I think that was one class that I felt was excellent and uh, a lot of information there for us to look at. Thank you. Who else? All right, I'm next. I'm up. All right, so one thing I love about going to the conferences is really, um, yes, you get your hours, you have to get all that in, but also the bonding experience that we as a board get. And um, that kind of goes with one of the classes we took, but I, I just truly love being able to spend time and um, getting to know each other so when we get into the boardroom, we understand each other's personalities and we're able to talk to one another better once we've spent some time together um, actually in classes and doing that. So that's one of the benefits I love about going to training sessions with our group. Um, and saying that, we're a group. And that's what I learned. We took a class, it's called Steering the District Through Board Adopting Vision and Goals. And we've kind of talked about this before, but um, we are a group. And this is a new group. We have new people on board, and we've had that for the last few years. And um, the class was about adopting new visions and mission statements as our new group. And we need to do that. We need to um, get there, get together and uh, create our visions and um, visions for the district as our new board is together. And they kind of gave some advice on numbers and concrete uh, things, you know, bringing it all together. But that's what I took is we really need to figure out what our vision and mission and goals are as a board, as we sit here now. Everything is out there now, and you got to be on top of telling your own story. 
I'm going to tell our story before the public does because sometimes the public don't tell it right, right? So that's the thing is being transparent, and I feel like now we have the opportunity to be transparent because I want to educate our entire community. I want to educate, educate our young people, our parents. That way, we can be ahead of the game. And when we educate our community, we make a better community, y'all. So that's, that's, that was my thing. You can see how passionate I am. <laughs> Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna wait to last. These these people crazy hanging out with them. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I like to, I like to enjoy a little laughter, but um, I, I could say Miss Kelly just kind of summed a whole lot of it up in in one. Um, there was a a class in particular that we took on the Saturday that I really liked um, that Desoto ISD um, put on. And the president that was there um, spoke a lot about transparency and um, openness and accountability. Accountability. I say the word for me. Accountability. Um, she spoke a lot about that, and that's and that's what I really um, like about things is holding everybody accountable for what they're supposed to be doing, um, and and just giving them the opportunity to know that. Well, they 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 did a program. They they use a program that kind of opens up to the either the community as well as um, the board understands the, their roles and what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then there's no, what I, what I took from it, there was no surprise is that when it became time for evaluations and any other type of things, we already kind of had a heads up of knowing what to do, what not to do, what, was, what we was looking for, what we wasn't looking for, as well as the, the community knowing what was going on, meaning that it was all out in the open and it was it was when it came down for board meetings and and closed sessions and things. It was already it was already it, it was made it easier for a discussion um, because it was already put out there. So. I guess I'll go last. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing that I learned, um, and it was one of the first sessions we took on Friday, and I, I probably talk, I wore probably all of y'all out about it, but um, it was Yisleta ISD and out in El Paso, how they're a, they're a landlocked district. You know, they've got no room for growth. They have Mexico on one side, city of El Paso on one, one side. Um, state of New Mexico on one side and then Fort Bliss on the other. And so there is no room for growth in that town. The town has got a, a defined boundary. And what do you do when the average age of your school is 93 years old? That was, that was the average age of every building. And so um, how do you replace air conditioners? And they had, at the time, 67 buildings. So how do you replace air conditioners for 67 buildings, how do you replace lights for all your seven st athletic stadiums? And when I say sta athletic stadiums, it's football, basketball, football, baseball, softball, and track. And um, they had some other fields too because they, they, they have lacrosse and some other stuff. So, I mean, how do you do all that? And um, gave some great, great tools and uh, 
I think we're going to kind of look into that, and we're going to try to see if that. You know, hopefully, we can see if that works for us. Um, I think it gave gave us a good s springboard because our buildings are old, and we need new air conditioners, and we need new lighting. So, hopefully, we can take what we learned, and then. Ms. Kelly, if you can just give us a little quick update about um, the delegate committee for TASB. Well, first of all, it's an honor to serve as a delegate. And to be in the room with other board trustees throughout our state that are so passionate about public education and um, for the, the different districts to come up with, come up with resolutions to take to our legislative session. Because we do know this upcoming legislative session is going to be very, it's going to be very serious. There's going to be like a lot of public communication about safety and security, about teacher retention, all that. And so, um, you know, on that level, I just um, encourage um, everybody to pay attention to what's going to take place in the next session because um, it's going to be serious. It's going to be a lot. Of, you know, I'm sure. You know, a lot of this is going to be there. You know. But um, get involved in that on that level. I, I really, you know, I'm thankful that our district is part of that part process because you got some districts that probably don't really care. But um, one of the resolutions that they did present that we voted on um, at the Delegate Assembly was um, about, I mean, I did, you know, uh, about the rehire, uh, the rehire and rehire extension for substitute teacher. Because you do know when you, when you retire for substitute teacher, when you retire, they kind of penalize you for that. And so we're, we're, we're presenting a resolution for them to, to change that, you know, that language. And so we're going to see what's going to happen when they when we talk about that particular resolution. So um, it's, it is an honor, and um, I, I take I take my delegate position serious because you know I got to spoke to Mike about one particular topic, and um, just seeing the passion about our board, our board, board trustees across the state. You know, we got some board trustees, we got some people in the that are really working for our kids and for our, our teachers. And so they're going to fight. You know, they're going to fight for public education. They're going to have to fight. Because you, you know all the challenges that we have. And when I see these resolutions and when they come, they, after they pass them and all that, I can say, hey, that's the one, one, one that we voted on. You know, and that's why I'm so passionate about that level. And y'all might see me on another level one day, because I take it serious, you know, for real. So anyway, that, that's my take on it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it. All right, now we're going to move into transportation vehicle report, something we asked Dr. Dr. Frost. So, and I think Mr. Mr. Cox. Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is going to give you a little bit of information on our fleets, our bus fleets, and our our white fleets. Uh, the the things I think y'all got a copy of this, and hopefully it's color coded on the bus fleet. But the, uh, the biggest things y'all going to be concerned about, I believe, is going to be the age, the mileage, and the primary purpose of our buses, if you'll if you look down on those. Uh, of course, activity trip, we've got those marked down. Those take our teams out of town, different places, take our extracurricular activities everywhere. Uh, we've got our special ed buses. They're marked in blue. Uh, the ones with the WC on the side, that's a wheelchair lift. Those, those are the buses that have a wheelchair lift. Then we've got some white trip buses. The uh, the white buses with with not a primary use on the outside that, that aren't color coded, those are our everyday buses. Those are what runs our routes uh, every day. Uh, if you can see, and then you know you can look at the mileage there. Uh, you know you can you can look at it. You know seventy seven thousand miles doesn't seem like a whole lot of mileage on our cars. Okay, you're talking about a seventeen thousand pound bus that's starting and stopping you know, several times a day, morning and afternoon, and then you add 7,000, 8,000 pounds of kids on there, I mean, it gets, it's pretty hard on those engines, so that, that mileage starts going up. But let, let me throw in a plug for our mechanics on there. Those guys do a great job. Uh, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have something go down on the engine in the afternoon, and Mike or Jeremy will, will jump right on it so we can have that bus the next morning, especially when we got eight activity trips going out the next morning. And they'll get that so that bus can be back on route the, the next morning. But those, those are some of the things that we've got going, going on with the, the mileage. And you can see some of those others are marked in yellow. We hardly ever use them. But, uh, you know, we go back to, let's say, you know, the example where we've got eight buses going out in the, in the morning. Okay, we've got, a, we've got five activity trip buses, so we've got to take three off 
we want to send good buses. We don't want buses broken down on the highway anywhere. So we're sending good buses. So, you know, 16, that, that just happens to be a bus that I'm driving right now. We'll pull that one. And yeah, I think the other day I drove 108, okay? That, you know, I just, it's just no worn out engine. It got the job done. I, it doesn't bother me to drive them. But, you know, that, that's, that's when those buses get used. They don't get used very often, okay? It, it just in those extreme circumstances. <clears throat> the red ones, most of those are, they, they've either been wrecked or, or something's gone wrong with them. Uh, like 117, it was rear-ended last year, two years ago. And you know we're using it up for parts. We got a couple other buses that we can't hardly find parts for, but we can use one 117 to use those parts like a dash or something along those lines. We can use that bus to do that, so we can we can get that. On the white fleet, if you go through, you, you go through, and again you got the year. We, we got some older vehicles here too, and they they're all pretty high mileage, especially when you look down there toward the end of it. Uh, we got all the police cars; they're all in pretty good shape. Now they're they're a little bit harder for us to work on. Uh, Jeremy and Mike, Bobby and, and Lonnie, you know they they know how to do it. They can service them, take care of everything we need. You know we go to have to put in a new engine or something like that. That's something that we really can't can't do. There's a lot of electronics involved in those police cars. They're a little specialty. Uh, then we got the ag vehicles. They're marked to AG. The the maintenance and operations that can be the maintenance folks, uh, the grounds crew, the custodians. Uh, you know our shop truck or our shop trucks going to transportation, but you know they can be in the the big box trucks or anything along those lines, and so they they'll get the that's what all those are, are for the transportation vehicles. You know we've got one right now we're down a transportation vehicle that teachers would normally take to go to the conferences or what have you, but we're we're transport transporting some special need uh, special needs deaf ed students from uh, I say the Trinity River uh, Trinidad. When we go out there twice a day to pick those kids up and drop them off from other districts, so that 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 one's kind of tied. That one's tied up with them right now, okay. And then the, the big pickup for transportation, you know, that goes with everything you see it when the band goes out, when anybody goes out, it's, it's pulling the trailers. It's, it's got people being used all the time. A few other statistics on uh, on our on our transportation. The average age of our daily fleet vehicles is is and that's our big buses is 10.7 years okay and then the average mileage on those same vehicles is 136,000 109 that's that's the average mileage on the buses that we run out every day you you want to start when you start getting about 100 100,000 miles 110,000 miles you want to start rolling those things out and put them into a backup situation uh, we, we do a good job, our guys do a good job of keeping up the vehicles. And so, I mean, they're, they're serviced twice. It's an ongoing process for them. I mean, it's Monday morning, he's got a list there. We're going to service this vehicle, this vehicle, this vehicle. It'll be buses, be police cars, be maintenance. But we're always servicing vehicles. So they keep up with everything. They, you know, get new tires put on, they inspect them. And uh, that, that's another thing with the, the ones marked in yellow on the buses. We do keep those inspected in case we do ever need them. So, I mean, they're. They, they we keep those up in good running condition also okay uh, for our special needs routes the average age for those is eight years old and the average mileage on those is 122,000 uh, you can notice a couple of them down there that you know got over 240,000 miles on them uh, and, th and those are everyday users I mean we, we do use those and that's that's a gasoline engine that's more like what you and I drive every day okay so that that's getting on up there for those vehicles all right. Uh, the the people we have out there right now, you know, there's uh, there's tw well, there's 28 uh, regular ed bus routes every morning. And that's that's from home to school, and then from school to home, we got 28 big buses that take kids home, and then we've got nine routes for special ed, and that's that's home to school and school to home. Okay, that doesn't count all of our school to school or, or you know, if we go on work programs or anything like that. So we've got nine of those routes. And then we've got midday routes where kids only go half a day or they come in a couple hours or, or something along those lines. So we've got seven of those routes every day. Also, the, and the ones I didn't count in there, you know, we've got our gifted and talented, our athletic shuttles, our ready, set, teach. We, we've got those, and, we, and you know, last week we had the big event 
where we had just about every route bus running and taking kids over to the high school for the program. You know, that was a, our, our drivers did a good job getting those folks going. So we also do a lot of stuff during the middle of the day, get, getting those things going. As far as the personnel we've got out there, we, we're, uh, we're 26 drivers right now. Uh, that puts us about four short. That's, uh, that's with uh, Mike, Jeremy, Tammy, and myself driving. You know, we're all on those to, to keep, uh, keep those up. Uh, Jeremy's our, uh, he's our relief driver. I like to keep a mechanic back in case something goes wrong because, you know, somebody can call in something, he can run out there and get it fixed right quick, get them back on their way. So that's why I drive that instead of stay back. I'd rather have a mechanic that knows what he's doing with the, with the buses stay back and, and do that. But there, there's many days where, where he's driving, okay, and then and somebody else calls in sick, so we're, we're doubling up routes on, on everybody. So, you know, we're still a few, few drivers short. Uh, we're, we're starting a program now where we can train our drivers to go get their, their license. Uh, we've, we've got two of them in that program right now. are getting towards the end of it, and we'll get them on routes and get them on buses here. Hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. It's a harder process than what it used to be. You know, 30 years ago, when I went to get my driver's license, I went down. It took me 45 minutes. I took a test, went and drove, and I had a license. Okay, it's it's a two-month process now, so it, it, it gets crazy. <clears throat> uh, some other interesting things: uh, total mileage per day. On our school buses, we, we run about, uh, on all buses, run about 1,950 to 2,000 miles a day with all of our routes. You know, we've got some to go out to Richland. We've got some to just stay here in this area, but, but we do spread them all out pretty good. And we also carry, right now, about 1,400 students morning and afternoon. That, that number will go up as soon as football season is over. It, it always does. And, uh, you know, we'll get quite a few more of those kids that don't do other sports. You know, they'll be the football players, band, people along those lines. Okay. Uh, and just to give you a little information in case you get concerned from parents or anything, we've got a couple of buses that we're starting to have to to double up routes. Uh, I've got one that he runs a junior high route, takes all those kids home, comes back and picks up the high school. And that's all he runs is high school, junior high. But he, instead of doing it in one route in the afternoon, he's got a He's got to run it twice, so it makes those kids a little later getting home, getting on the bus. But, and uh, matter of fact, the bus that I'm driving, I'm probably going to be doing that in the next week or two to, to do that because it's all high school and junior high as well. All right, and that's all just because of the number of students that are getting on there. Uh, we've even got one bus that she runs through her route three times. Yeah, you know, she'll pick up Collins kids and Sam Houston, run a route, pick up Navarro kids, run a route, and go back and get the high school and junior high kids and run a route again. So she runs through it three times. So, I, but I mean, those, those are ways they all know it's expected of them, and that's that's what we what we've got to do. All right. Is there any questions? I guess the short buses trying to make it under that railroad track so it's Friday. That was. Stop. I'm like, oh my goodness, but he got he got going. The one where the truck hit the. No, it was just it was very. I guess it almost stalled. Okay. Uh, that that was probably been 133. His bus was actually down, and he was on our backup special needs bus. Oh, yes. The, um, the vehicles and buses that we have um, marked in red for the bone yards, once we utilize all the parts that we can get, do we have a disposal program of uh, maybe selling them off? Or, or no, that, that, that's something we need to come up with. Uh, when I was in another district in Middle Othen, you know, we went through a board process to, to you know, either take them across the scales for scrap yard or sell them to, for some, to somebody that might want them. Okay, it's a, uh, you know, there, there's a couple things you got to do. You know, some of the government deals, when we're involved in it, they want you to destroy the engine so nobody, you know, those are old diesels. They don't want those things back out on the road. And so they'll make you, before you sell them, they'll make you knock a hole in the block. I do have a question. Um, the 20, you said there's 28 bus routes. Is that including the nine special ed? Or No, there's 28, gen, we call them gen ed. That's our mm -hmm. big buses. There's 28 of those. Nine special needs morning and afternoon. That's home to school, school to home. Okay. Okay. That doesn't count any special needs during the middle of the day. Okay. You know, if we if we take those kids to a work program or anything like that. How many miles is the average bus? I know you said nineteen hundred fifty-two thousand miles. That's the whole fleet per day. But real, roughly, how many miles does the bus go in a day? And in a day, we, you know, we've got anywhere. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got that right here. We've got some that go up to well, 126 a day. It goes out to Richland. 
Uh, and then the, the, the bus that I'm on, I drive 26 a day, 13 morning, 13 afternoon. So it varies. It's got a pretty big variance. Uh, normally what I do when, I, when I'm talking about fleets, I usually, as, as just a general rule, and this is not hard and fast, is 10 to 12,000 miles a year per vehicle. Buses, not, not maintenance vehicles. That, those will be changed up. And when it comes to our white fleet, are there cars that we're not using? We've got two right now that we're not using. We've got some that need to be sold. I think there's a couple over in the, we call it the boneyard, but they're, they're over there and uh, they, they probably need to be scrapped as well. We've got one that needs a, an oil pan and one that we're having a hard time finding for. It's an old Jeep. And, uh, you know, they just, I think it's a 94, 95 mile, somewhere around there, and it's a, well, that's written down there somewhere. But, you know, finding parts for that when another one just came in and needs an engine in it. Uh, we've got those, you know, they deliver supplies across the district. Uh, custodial staff and yard crew usually use those. And how long do they normally sit over the phone before you start thinking about it? I, they, I, I've been, I, I keep it on my mind all the time. Uh, this is my fourth year here and we, we need to move them on, move them on out. <laughs> Well, it's uh, we we've got we've got some we got like a, a small bus that was in an accident before I got here. The whole front end's gone off of it. It's sitting over there. We've got some that've had to take engines out of to put into to another bus that they're sitting over there. There, you know, five or six I think are sitting over there. But you can see them from the from 45th. That's my problem. Yes, it's, it's yes. Yes. I had a, well, I was at one place where I had a 1991 model bus, and I had to make parts for it in the in the ag shop. So. And these buses that's in the ball yard, they're just. They're they're no use. I mean, it's uh, whatever metal we can get out of them. All right, thank you. Thank you. Review membership of the School Health Advisory Council in the Shack. All right, Dr. Frost, Dr. Brown, members of the board, uh, I'll be as uh, quick as I can on this just to give you a, a little review on what the uh, Sh Shack Committee is at School Health Advisory Council. Um, it is a committee comprised of uh, mostly community members, mostly parents. Um, the majority must be uh, non-employee parents. So we, do, we do really do have a good representation of the community that's on the, this committee. I serve on it with uh, Nurse Witt, who assembles it. Um, this is a requirement through the Texas Education Code. Every school district in the state has to have it. Um, and it's created to ensure that uh, local community values are reflected in the health health education instruction in our district. Uh, I'd like to ask, I believe you, got, you have the list and board book, I'd like to ask for uh, approval of the SHAC committee list for the 22-23 school year. Can I make a suggestion? Absolutely. I know you're, you're on there, but we need some males. You need, need some males. Yeah, I, okay. I get it. We, we always, females always, you know, doing stuff. But can we encourage our males to get on board with this organization because um, it's important to have all representation, you know, so we need some male. Yes, ma'am. I know we can find some male dads, some, you know, some dads and stuff to do on it. Yeah, Kamara, Seth, be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'll do it. Kelly's already on it, isn't she? Mm-hmm. She is. We need She's some other female. males. She's a female. I know, but we need some other males. We do need some males. I'm on it. Thank you. Do, you need a motion? Do we, need a, we need a motion to approve the I shack? I that we approve the shack committee member list as presented. Is there a second? Second. All right. We got a motion and a second to approve the shack committee member list as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and this list has been approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bulwer. 
And now we're going to go to the district improvement plan. Good evening, Dr. Brown, distinguished board members, Dr. Frost. I am here this evening to give an update to the 22-23 district improvement plan. I'm going to highlight the areas that are really new um, or some things that have been changes since the prior year uh, district improvement plan. So on page 14 in your board book, you will be on the page that says comprehensive needs assessment and it starts with the demographics summary update. As you can see, our district enrollment has definitely improved. It has actually increased a little bit since this was put into the um, board book. We are now at 6,053 enrollment. Um, we have had a slight increase over the prior year, but our numbers continue to climb. You can see the breakdown um, at the campuses below there. Um, our largest elementary school um, right now is Navarro, Navarro Elementary at 613 students. <coughs> Our intermediate school has around 868. Uh, Corsicana High School around 1760 and Corsicana Middle School um, 928. I think there was an extra zero there. We do not have 9,000 students at the middle school, I can assure you. <laughs> Um, our demographic makeup is um, very slight in differences from the prior year. You can see the breakdown um, in the section there. Our economically disadvantaged percentage was actually a little bit lower um, from the prior year. It was at 71.69%. Our emergent bilingual learners, approximately 26.69%. And you can see the breakdown between bilingual and EL learners there. I want to highlight the demographic strengths in the area below there. There were several areas in Corsicana uh, that are definitely worth uh, mentioning that were very significant in relationship to our demographics. Um, with our accountability targets, and as you know, with our achievement targets, everything is set by our demographic groups. And we have targets to hit with student accountability from our student achievement, as well as growth targets and college and career military readiness. So the first area I want to highlight is in the college career military readiness. At seven out of nine student groups were met with the student achievement targets. That was our all student group, African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, our emergent bilingual, special education, and continuously enrolled students. In addition, we also met the state accountability achievement targets in nine out of 12 of the student groups. That was all students, African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, our EL learners, special education, continuously enrolled, and non-continuously enrolled. Another exciting area was that we met all of our accountability targets in math for our African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, and special education student groups. And our, our biggest highlight was in the area of reading. We met 11 out of 12 growth targets in reading for all students, African American, Hispanic, white, Pacific Islander, economically disadvantaged, emergent bilingual, special education, continuously enrolled, and non-continuously enrolled. So we were very excited about the increases in that area, which was the, probably the most significant area from the prior year. So we're very excited about that. On page 15 in your board book, I would also like to highlight some areas under the student achievement summary that were updates from the prior year. We met or outperformed the state averages in the state of Texas in nine of our tested areas, which includes our US History Star EOC test at the high school. We also exceeded the state performance area for math in six out of eight areas in comparison to the state. We also exceeded state performance in the areas of meets and master's performance areas in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth, seventh math, algebra one at the, high, at the middle school, eighth grade reading, fifth grade science, eighth grade science, and US history. Um, at the elementary level, reading and writing were our primary um, areas of focus for closing gaps, especially um, post-COVID. The district met the state targets in the areas for reading um, in African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, EL learners, special ed, continuously enrolled, and non-continuously enrolled. 
And then to round out that section, the district also met state targets in math for the following student groups that you can see listed there, African American, Hispanic, eco dis and special education. We'll continue this year to focus on using our an NWEA map screener. That was a new test for us last year, and it does help us to identify areas needing improvement and to really pinpoint the areas that we would want to target for interventions, extended school days, Saturday school, and any kind of wraparound services that we need to continuously close the gaps. The areas that you'll see below there were our out accountability ratings, and as you can see, Corsicana ISD uh, maintained, the, maintained the B rating for the school district. And then below there, you'll see the performance areas for all students or all subjects, reading and math. On page 16 in your board book, there is a breakdown of the campuses and their overall ratings. If you'll remember the year before, we did not have accountability ratings because of the uh, COVID and because of TEA not giving us those ratings for a couple of years. So this is a new addition for us this year. We're kind of back to the way that we had reported before. There are some outstanding areas of student academic strengths there um, below um, that you can see where we're having some wonderful gains. Um, I've mentioned a few of these, so I'm not going to repeat all of them, but I would draw your attention to number two. Um, our dual language students are outperforming the state in all tested areas for reading and math. Uh, we also had increased student achievement for that particular campus. It exceeded the state performance by 19 percentage points, so that was a very significant um, increase. Also, as you know, we have a House Bill 3 board goal for third grade reading. We also met that goal um, in the area of meets or master's performance, um, achieving 46%. That is significant because our target for that, we actually achieved our 2024 target for third grade meets last year in 2022. So we are now on target, we're like a year or two ahead of our local board goals for third grade reading at meets performance level. So that's really exciting. We also met our board goal in college and career military readiness by increasing our industry-based certifications um, and our pathways to 19%. We also exceeded the TELPASS targets at four campuses. And then of course I mentioned the increase in our reading targets on number five, or number six. Another area that is new for reporting this year is distinction designations, and these are really, really exciting. These are areas that we can um, really celebrate. Um, we are each campus has a campus comparison group, and it's a group that's supposed to be comprised of schools that look like them in size, mobility. Uh, demographics, economically disadvantaged, and things of that nature. And then they compare you and your scores to the schools in your comparison group. If you are in the top 25% of your comparison group, then you can earn distinction designations. So when we get designations, we want to shout those out. It really is an exciting um, thing for our campuses. So starting with Bowie Elementary, they received three designations. We received one in the area of math, one in the area of comparative academic growth, and then another one in comparative closing the gaps. Yes, <laughs> Carroll Elementary received two designations. One of those is post-secondary readiness, and I wanted to share what that um, means and how you earn that. So for post-secondary readiness, um, there's an index four and there is an all students group. And so that's every student in that, on that campus that accounts for us under accountability. They have to be ranked among the top 25% of that campus comparison group, and it is comparing them with their scores at that meets performance level. So not minimum passing rate at approaches, but meets or higher. So for that campus, they were in the top 25% of their comparison groups and earned a post-secondary readiness distinction. Very exciting. Um, as well as, yes, as well as comparative closing the gaps. Navarro Elementary earned a distinction designation in the language arts area for reading. Sam Houston Elementary received one for the area of reading, math, comparative academic growth, post-secondary readiness, as well as com uh, comparative closing the gaps. And then Collins Intermediate also received distinction designations in math, science, and post-secondary readiness. So we are very excited for those areas to be highlights in our district coming on the heels of, of COVID and the areas that we've been working very hard to close gaps in. Moving on, um, I'm going to skip ahead to the areas where our goals are. There have not been any changes in the, in the areas um, in the uh, data area there, but if you'll go to 
page 22 in your board book. This will be falling under goal one. And goal one is our strategy for meeting or exceeding all state and federal standards for academic excellence. And I'm only gonna highlight the areas that have changes and I will, of course, have questions for any areas that you would like more information on. I'd like to draw your attention to strategy number six. It is not a change necessarily, but I did want to highlight that with the new STAR testing coming up, there is a heavy focus on the area of writing in our grade levels, especially for third grade and fourth grade, but it actually goes all the way up. Students this year will be 100% online, and that includes doing open answer responses in the computer for questions, in addition to writing compositions. This includes doing that on the computer, which means keyboarding skills will be at play this year. The Jane Schaefer writing strategies are not new to the district. It is something that we've seen significant increases in, but we are going to be amping up and have already started doing additional trainings in this area, and then also integrating instructional technology for keyboarding practice. So those will be areas that we will be focusing on this year, um, probably a little bit more than we have in the past in order to properly prepare our students for the upcoming um, state test. On page 23 in your board book, uh, one area that is new, and we, I think we have mentioned this once before, is under strategy eight. Um, we will be continuing working on closing the gaps in foundational literacy, which that is not new, but the added area there that is new is with the Saxon Phonics Program. Our teachers are beyond excited with implementation with this, and we don't find that very often. When you talk about implementing something new, that usually is um, something that takes a bit of time and, and, and kind of coming around to. But our teachers actually had requested and wanted there to be more of a focus um, with additional resources for phonics. And we started this about two weeks ago. Um, it has gone very, very well. And so that area is new, and you will see that we have allotted money um, through our ESSER grant to support that initiative, and that has been outstanding. I'm going to uh, skip over to page 24. And nothing new there, but wanted to just let you know that we will be continuing our summer enrichment programs with Camp Curiosity and the English Language uh, Learner Academy. Um, and so we're also very excited about those coming up in the summer. On page 25 in your board book, these are the areas that we um, have that align to our digital evolving needs. There is not a, a large change on that page, although I did want to draw your attention to strategy one, that we'll be, be continuing to facilitate increased training for teachers in the areas of instructional technology, mostly for us to be able to properly prepare students for the STAR test and the things that they'll be doing um, on that. One of the areas that is new for STAR this year is students showing what they know and not just taking a chance at F4 choices on multiple choice. And so with that, they have to create graphs and they have to do uh, drag and drop type things. And so our instruction has to be somewhat plugged and then somewhat unplugged so that we can properly practice this on a daily basis in addition to what will be coming at them when they do uh, benchmarks and then the test in the spring. On your board book on page 26, this is our, re our reoccurring house bill goal. Just wanted to draw your attention that our goal for literacy in third grade is 45% by June of 2024. That is our early childhood literacy goal. We actually exceeded that goal last year. We hit 46%. So we are shooting for 50% for 2023. That should get us even further ahead down the road. And so we are excited about that and that is the only change on that particular strategy. On page 27 in your board book is our other required house bill board goal, which is for STAR math. We are shooting to increase that by 44% in June of 2023. We are on target for that goal, and so we are continuing to focus on our math um, strategies to increase that performance area. On page 28 in your board book for college and career military readiness, we are also on target to hit our goal by August of 2024, which is 60%. Our 2023 goal will be to go from 51 to 55%. The strategies will remain the same. The only difference is on strategy three, we will be offering a college prep course and we're beginning plans on this, which is specifically designed for post COVID academic gaps. And that is something that Mr. Doring and his team are working on at the high school, as well as Mr. Johnson. And so that is gonna be an area we will continue to evolve with our college and career military readiness. Um, 
Going to fast forward a couple of pages into goal two, which is page 31 in your board book. Strategy one is using a variety of media platforms uh, to inform and educate in both English and Spanish. I just wanted to draw your attention to that because with our new app for the smartphone, as well as the Roar magazine, those are some added additions there with communications. All the other strategies under performance objective two remain the same. And then moving into goal three, which starts on page 32 in your board book. The first performance objective under providing a safe and secure learning environment, all three of those strategies remain the same with our standard response protocol training, our required safety trainings, as well as the care team. An area that is new is on page 33 in your board book under strategy one, that the CISD administration and law enforcement will receive the weapon detector training, which we already completed that, but then the added weapon detectors for the campuses this year um, is something new for our board uh, district improvement plan this year. The other two areas are continues um, from the prior year. What you'll find in the following pages um, after you pass the district funding summary are going to be policy procedure requirement areas. And starting on page 36, which I will not go page by page, but from page 36 in your board book, you're gonna see a section that is new that is called addendums. The addendums are areas that TEA does require for us to focus on that are mandates on our procedures or possibly our practices. And each one of the pages following, there's about 15 to 16, is a different addendum that focuses, focuses on a different area that already aligns to our district policies or possibly a Texas Education Code. So the pages following that through to the back of the board book are all areas that we are required to report and they just kind of have their own special section now. So that is the added part to our district improvement plan um, and it ends on the very last page with the job description for our peace officers, resource office, officers and security personnel. Outside of that, there are no other changes to the district improvement plan are there any questions? Do you have any questions? Ah, thank you, Kim. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. So we, we need a vote to approve the improvement plan. Do we have a motion for that? I move we approve the 22-23 district improvement plan focused improvements as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the 2022-23 district improvement plan focused improvements as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. And Thank we you. have approved this. Thank you. All right. Now we are moving to the advanced course waiver list. Mr. Doring, can you come up and talk a little bit about this? We have this included in our... Um, included in our um, board book and basically uh, the UIL requires us to have a list provide a list of courses that we can waive for no pass no play uh, basically what we do is we get you get 10 points if you take one of these courses but we are uh, we are required to give a list of the course courses that are that get this uh, get this waived so that's what this is the board has to approve this each year um, so real simple it's all of our honors courses AP courses our dual credit courses um, you do not have to get uh, you don't you not have to be passing them to be eligible if you're taking dual credit because it's through the college and the way they do the grading it's uh, the UIL waives those dual credit classes but any honors course or pre AP course has to be on this list and you get our district uh, says that you get 10 points that's really all it is Thank you, Mr. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Doring? He does every year, so do we have a motion? I move to approve the advanced course waiver list as presented. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the advanced course waiver list as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and we will we've approved the advanced course waiver list. Now we're moving to the monthly and quarterly budget report. So you have included um, in your packet the monthly 
budget report, of course, we are at the very beginning of the um, funding year, so everything looks pretty rosy right now. Um, we're doing well on our spending, and our percentages are, um, are in line. Um, you'll see, of course, on the revenue side, you're going to see a um, significant amount of revenue coming in for the remainder of the year, and you'll see that fluctuate as it, as it comes in from tax collections as well as the state and federal money. Then on the quarterly budget report, um, really the close to the same um, piece of information, um, we're doing well um, within our budget um, just this far into the school year. I think we just were on the seventh week of the school year. So um, everything looks fine. It's in line. Um, there's not any surprises. I think the only surprises that we really have um, are very positive, and that is that our attendance looks good. Of course, at the end of this month, is our snapshot day, which is the last Friday of October, so that's a big day for us. And also, um, our attendance being up as much as it is is a little um, is more students than we actually anticipated, so that's a plus for our budget as well. All right, thank you, Dr. Frost. Okay, now we're going to move on to the consent agenda. If y'all had a chance to look that over. I move uh, we approve the consent agenda as presented. All right. Is there a second? All right, I got a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it, and we will approve the consent agenda. Okay, we're going to adjourn into closed session, permitted by Texas Governance Code Section 551.01. Thank you very much.